Hello there, welcome to this GCSE history revision video on people's health 1250 to the present day. This video focuses on industrial Britain um, around 1750 to 1900. Just a reminder of the key themes that you need to know for people's health is impact on living conditions, improving public health and response to epidemics. Key factors to be aware of are beliefs, attitudes and values. We see a lot of changes in that in this time period. The impact of local and national government, which moves from the idea of laissez-faire to taking a more direct approach over people's health. Science and technology, urbanisation, which is a huge factor here because we see lots of people moving from the countryside to the city. And then wealth and poverty and that diversity of experience. Uh, we see a lot of that in this topic as well. So in this revision video, we're going to be looking at these different topic areas. We're going to look at an overview of industrialization, the growth of the major cities and any political change during this time. We're going to look at living conditions and urban living conditions in the 19th century, looking at housing, food, clean water and waste. We're going to look at responses to the cholera epidemic in the 19th century. And then we'll look at public health reform in the 19th century, including the 1848 Public Health Act, the 1875 Public Health Act and other local in initiatives as well. In terms of how you assess for people's health, um, you have the three gateway questions. Question two is a right, clear and organised summary that analyses. So you need to write two paragraphs linked to one or more second order concepts. Question three is a why question or it can be what was the impact of question. So a cause consequence question. Again, two paragraphs. And then question four, question five is the how far do you agree question. And you just need to be really aware that on people's health, it's quite often questions that ask you to compare different time periods. You need four key arguments with a degree of balance and a conclusion, a clinching argument. OK, so let's have a look at the idea of the Industrial Revolution. So the Industrial Revolution sees huge change in Britain. That's one of the reasons why it's known as an industrial revolution. A revolution is a word that we use to describe a huge change um, or a very rapid change. And there's no doubt that there is a huge change during this time. One of the big um, areas for change is movement of people. People move from the countryside to the towns. In 1750, about 90 percent of people lived in the countryside. By 1900, about 90 percent of people lived in towns or cities. People moved to live in different parts of the British Empire. People moved from town to town using new transport like railways. Um, so there's increased urbanisation and a huge population increase from 7 million in 1750 to 41 million roughly in 1900. There is more democracy during this time, so more and more men were given the right to vote in 1832, 1867 and 1884. And this is one of the reasons why we see some changes to improve the living conditions of poorer people in society during this time. Governments had to take more notice of the needs of the poorer people. Um, women, however, did not get the vote until 1918. In terms of society, the middle class had grown in power and number, they lived in better conditions in the suburbs and were often ignorant of industrial slums. The working classes tend to be ignored as their living conditions got worse and most people do not have the vote. Um, but we are starting to see some changes in terms of education for children. In 1870, children under 10 began to get a guaranteed education. In terms of work, people stopped working from home in the so-called domestic system and now began to work in factories. Factory work was hard and difficult. There was lots of pollution um, and um, some of the changes in farming in the countryside made the supply of food easier now. So there's less problems of things like um, starvation and famine. People's ideas changed. The theory of evolution was accepted. Religious belief declined. Scientists discovered that germs caused disease. Louis Pasteur did that in 1861. That led to better understanding of the cause of disease. And there was the temperance movement, which tried to encourage people to not drink alcohol. Transport and technology improved massively. Railways with steam trains transported goods nationwide. Steamships sailed with goods to and from the British Empire. The British Empire led to a huge increase in trade and brought wealth to some people, but a growing divide between rich and poor. Now, living and working conditions for some people during the industrial pe uh, period were absolutely terrible. Um, and you can see in that image there the um, harsh overcrowding, the poverty, the sort of cramped, miserable conditions that people were living in, living in. Lifestyles got worse due to crowded, poorly built slum houses. Some of these houses are known as back to back houses. Disease was very common, which was mainly caused by dirty water, led to waterborne diseases like cholera and typhoid. Now, towards the end of the 19th century, government were forced to do more to help poorer people. And that was partly due to more men getting the vote, especially after the 1867 Reform Act. 
Again, there's another image here where you can see the stark difference between the living conditions of rich and poor. In the distance, you can see the suburbs where most of the wealthy people lived that wasn't affected by the horrific living conditions. On that diagram, you can see the cramped um, conditions, the back-to-back -back houses, and obviously people having to live in close proximity to the factories and lots of factory pollution and smoke would lead to types of pollution, sometimes known as pea super fogs because of the sort of green smoke that was spread during the Industrial Revolution from the burning of coal. This is Gustave Doré's London backyards from a train. And again, you can see there's back-to-back -back houses creating overcrowded uh, living conditions, cramped living conditions. Lots of people in the yards as house sharing is very common, so it's very cramped. Um, pollution from trains engulf the homes, large imposing railway viaducts built over the slums and dominate people's houses. And people had tiny shared privies or wash houses. They were the only way um, to keep clean. So one of the things was that people had to um, you know, share toilets and things like that. Um, so the conditions were really, really horrible during the Industrial Revolution. People's accommodation was directly related to how much money they had. Um, so the cheapest accommodation was um, a rented cellar space, which was damp and not ventilated. Back-to-back -back housing was cheap, often poorly constructed. Um, there was a lack of building regulations to govern um, the quality of housing. Family often had to just have one room downstairs, another upstairs. And the effect on health was significant. A lack of fresh air led to chest infections and lung-related diseases such as tuberculosis. And in that bottom right-hand picture, we can see one of William Frith's pictures, which just shows that stark divide between the wealthy, you know, in their sort of horse-drawn carriage and the poorer people in society. OK, so why were living conditions so awful? Well, firstly, the towns and cities grew incredibly quickly. So, for example, Manchester grew from 17,000 to over 300,000 in that time period. And that meant people's health got worse because the new towns couldn't cope with the increase in numbers. Diseases could spread very quickly. Landlord made huge profits um, from renting homes to industrial workers. Houses like back to back houses built really quickly. Property owners and builders didn't really care about people's health. So because houses were built quickly and cheaply, the housing quality was poor, they were cold, they were damp, they were overcrowded, led to the spread of disease. Town government was weak, expanding towns did not have a corporation to oversee how the town was run and organised. Many property owners who ran towns did not want an increase in taxes, which were known as rates at the time. So there weren't any proper facilities in these new towns, such as clean water or sewage systems, um, and that meant that there was a build-up of sewage and waste and that led to diseases like cholera, for example. There were no laws to ensure decent housing and protect people's health. National and local government at the start of the Industrial Revolution and in the early 19th century had what was called a laissez-faire approach. It's a really key concept. They thought they should leave people's lives alone. Leave alone, laissez-faire, that's what it means. And it's best not to interfere in people's lives. People don't, did not yet know that germs cause disease. People explain disease through either bad smells, miasma, or um, contagion. Louis Pasteur's germ theory was not published until 1861, and even then not everybody believed in it. And that meant there wasn't an urgency to bring in clean living conditions, as people did not realise that dirty towns would cause disease. Private water companies were unregulated and waste remained a problem. So water companies sourced their water from ponds, rivers and streams. It wasn't cleaned. The water was dirty, and unhealthy. Typhoid and cholera was spread through the dirty water. People didn't understand that dirty water caused disease. And in most areas of cheap industrial housing, the sewers could not cope with the amount of human waste. Existing sewers were mainly for draining rainwater, not human waste. So pools of stinking water filled the streets. Sewage filled things like rivers, for example, as well, made rivers um, extremely polluted and disgusting. Now, privies, which are toilets, collected waste, which built up until it was emptied or it overflowed by, say, somebody like a night soilman had the horrible job of emptying a privy. In a typical street of industrial housing, over 10 families might share one privy. Some houses were connected to six feet deep brick cesspools. Midden privies had only a hole under to collect waste, and they were difficult to empty with the night soilman having the job of collecting that waste. Now, there was the invention of flushing toilet, which had been invented way back in um, the end of Elizabethan times. More middle and upper class people started to have them and they were linked to sewers and drained into rivers where water companies got water to sell to middle and upper class houses for drinking, cooking or washing. So there's a real divide in terms of access to clean water. There were some new developments during this period, but they often created more problems. For example, where better sewers were built, the waste emptied into the rivers where water companies got their fresh water from. 
In terms of diet, the industrial working class's poor diet caused malnutrition and a weakened immune system. So the diet of the industrial working class was basic. It was potatoes, bread, butter, beer and tea. But beer was actually cheaper than tea, so it was a huge problem of alcohol in the 19th century. Um, in the towns and cities, it was difficult to obtain fruit and vegetables, so that contributed to malnutrition. Industrial workers had no access to land to grow food, which is unlike the medieval and early modern period. The diet was high in carbohydrates because that was needed. The energy was needed for long hours of labor. Until the end of the 19th century, there was an absolutely no government regulation of food. So working class families often ate food, which had been mixed with other products, and that's known as adulteration. So for example, sometimes chalk was mixed in um, with, with flour when making bread um, and things like that. So the food wasn't of good quality. Cheap meat was sometimes available to the poorer people, but the quality of the meat was very poor. It's sometimes taken from diseased animals. But from the 1860s, food could be preserved in cans, which helped to improve things a little bit. So in terms of the main diseases in the industrial era were tuberculosis, known as TB, um, largest killer in the 19th century. The disease was spread from person to person in droplets of water produced when coughing, thrived in overcrowded and poorly ventilated homes. Um, and the disease attacked the lungs. It was sometimes spread through unpasteurized cow's milk as well. Influenza was a virus transmitted through coughing and sneezing, causing fever, headaches, shivering, severe headaches and vomiting, regular outbreaks in the 19th century. Typhoid, a disease spread through food or water, contaminated human waste, sometimes carried by flies, which carried infected blood. Uh, Prince Albert, Queen Victoria's husband, actually died of typhoid fever in 1861, and it caused um, fever, severe headaches and diarrhea. Typhus, similar symptoms to typhoid, hence the similar names, was spread by bites from body lice, thrived in poor neighbourhoods where there was overcrowding and where people could not keep clean. And then diphtheria, spread through coughing and sneezing and transmitted through contact with clothing of an infected person, infected children causing swollen glands, fever and severe headaches. Okay, so you need to have a case study of cholera epidemics. So cholera spread quickly and it affected the poor uh, the most in Britain. Now cholera was brought to Britain in 1831 by sailors who arrived in British ports from India. There was a big outbreak in Leeds in 1832, killing 700 people. The symptoms of cholera were vomiting, stomach cramps, watery yellow diarrhea, people became dehydrated, pulse weakened, skin turned blue, you often died within one to two days. Horrible disease. The water um, became infected by the excrement of people who carried the disease, and that's what led to it further spreading. And there were cholera epidemics in 1831-32, 1848-1854, 1854, and 1865-66. Overall, it killed 100,000 people. Cholera outbreaks ended uh, once there were improvements in public health. Now, people believed in sort of really three main causes of cholera, miasma, religious causes, and the idea of contagion. This is a great source to think about cholera. The title of the source is Court for King Cholera. It's from a satirical magazine called Punch Magazine in 1852. And the title suggests cholera is very much in charge and the people are powerless in the face of it. Now, it's a good insight into industrial living conditions. You can see more than one family are sharing a room. You can see there's a huge rubbish heap that children are playing in. Women, a uh, woman is searching for it, which implies poverty and no organized system for waste disposal. Um, the picture shows a huge amount of people, which suggests overcrowding. The clothes hanging out of the window suggest lack of space. There's a boy there wearing rags and no shoes. He has a broom, which shows his job is probably a chimney sweep, which tells us about child labor. There's a lodging house there, which is temporary accommodation for poor people. Very overcrowded, it's the sort of place where disease would spread. And the coffin signifies death and disease that people have been dying. It could well be a cholera death. So a great source for just reinforcing our understanding about cholera and living conditions in the industrial revolution. OK, so beliefs and government responses um, changed through time uh, in terms of cholera. Now, the key concept was laissez-faire. So in the 1830s, people still believed in the miasma theory, which said that disease was spread by poisoned air. The church um, told everybody that, the, that cholera came from God as a punishment for sins. But some connections began to be made between dirt and disease, such as Robert Baker in Leeds, for example. So in terms of the national government response, the Central Board of Health was set up to study disease in other countries. And a National Day of Fasting, Humiliation and Prayer was set up on the 2nd of March 1832, which again shows that religious response. In terms of local government response, burning tar on the street was used to purify the air, clearing rubbish from the streets to stop the stench, quarantines to stop pe poor people from entering towns, separate hospitals and graveyards to stop contamination, and health boards to give advice and monitor the spread of cholera. So very much that belief in miasma and contagion is evident in those responses, but also that religious response as well. 
So in terms of the responses to the cholera epidemic in 1831 and 1832, there's a continuity in belief in bad air causing disease, which was seen in medieval times and the early modern era. There's a continuity in the idea of watches and searches in early modern times and the idea of isolating people in cholera hospitals, which are kind of similar to the pest houses we saw in the early modern period. Now, during the early modern period, authorities copied ideas from Scotland, France and the Italian city states about how they tackled the plague. And that's similar to the government trying to find out what's going on in terms of the cholera epidemics in other countries. Um, town corporations in the early modern um, era uh, printed summaries of plague orders, and that's really similar to what happened in cholera in terms of trying to map where the outbreaks were happening and trying to make sure people were given advice. And in both medieval and early modern period, people sought help from God through prayer and fasting. We can still see some people doing that with the cholera outbreaks as well. So lots of continuities as well, as well as some change in the approach there to um, an epidemic. OK, now in 1848, um, Edwin Chadwick produced his sanitary report and it contained shocking details of the public health crisis. Now, crucially, Edwin Chadwick still believed in the miasma theory himself. But the Public Health Act of 1848 set up the General Board of Health and encouraged local councils to set up health boards to clean up towns. Remember, Edwin Chadwick wanted the towns cleaned up so that um, it would tackle the problem of miasma. Now, there was limited progress as a result of the Public Health Act because it did not force change. Most town leaders thought the change would be too expensive and resented an increase um, in taxation to pay for the act. So this again shows you another example of how people responded to some of the health emergency of the cholera epidemics. Now in 1854, Dr. John Snow proved that cholera was spread by infected water. He found evidence um, that a water pump at Broad Street near his surgery was the cause of the disease in that area. However, there was very little impact of John Snow's discovery. Lots of people didn't believe it at the time. The laissez-faire attitude continued. The General Board of Health had actually been abolished by 1854. Um, and it wasn't really until later on, so by 1866, the ideas of Snow had now been widely accepted. And that's partly because in 1861, Louis Pasteur had proved that germs caused disease. Now, the Sanitary Act of 1866 made local councils responsible for sewers, water supply and street cleaning. Good sewers limited the impact of the 1866 cholera epidemic. London, for example, that already had a good sewage network that had opened in 1865, um, was, was not as badly affected by the cholera epidemic in 1865, 1866. And people started to see there was a connection between having good public health systems and tackling cholera. So we've seen there how knowledge about how disease spread improved through the works of scientists like John Snow and Louis Pasteur. So by the time of the 1866 cholera outbreak, the government was starting to abandon its laissez-faire attitude and introduce new laws to clean up the towns and cities. And that's what was required to stop the cholera outbreaks. So the miasma theory is replaced now by the germ theory. And that made dealing with the cause of disease like cholera much easier as the importance of cleanliness became accepted as a way to prevent disease. So this research led to a local and national government focus on providing clean water and good waste management systems. So the replacement, for example, of the midden privy, which was a toilet with a pit dug underneath, with a pale privy, which was a toilet with a removable bucket, as you can see on that diagram on the right hand side, was another example of how there were further health improvements. And we'll look at this in a bit more detail in a moment. But in 1875, a new Public Health Act replaced the 1848 Act, which forced local councils to take responsibility for cleaning up their town including the appointment of health inspectors. There were no further cholera outbreaks and epidemics in Britain after 1866, but it had taken four major ep epidemics and changes in scientific thought to bring about a change in the way the government dealt with diseases such as cholera. But the idea of laissez-faire was starting to be fully challenged. OK, so we're just going to go back and have a look at the Public Health Acts and local initiatives in a bit more detail now. So start off just by, again, refocusing on Edwin Chadwick's 1842 report on the sanitary conditions of the labouring population of Britain. And this challenged the government to introduce reform to address the poverty that many industrial workers lived in. Chadwick suggested a national public health authority to be set up, which would force local councils to improve public health by providing clean water and a sewage um, decent sewage system. Now remember Chadwick believes in the miasma theory and he wants this cleanup to happen to reduce bad smells. Um, Let's say fair is being challenged but water company bosses objected to Chadwick's proposals. They thought it might affect their profit. Rate payers objected to Chadwick's proposals um, as they did not want to make uh, to pay more tax. So um, local councils were not forced to bring about any changes as a result of this. 
And it was, of course, the cholera epidemic which triggered the 1848 Public Health Act. So there is some evidence of progress from the 1848 Public Health Act. It did create the General Board of Health and the government could force local councils to make public health improvements if they wanted to. Councils were encouraged to have a medical officer who would oversee local health issues. And it did begin to chip away at that idea of laissez-faire. However, the main limitations was that the government could only force local councils to make improvements if the death rate was really high, higher than 23 per 1,000. By 1853, there were only 163 places for local board of health, and the general board of health was actually abolished in 1854. So the long-term impact of the public health act was small. London was excluded, and there was no government minister for public health either. So let's have a look at some other initiatives. We already talked about the problem of the adulteration of food. There were no laws to protect people from eating unhealthy food. Bread was often made with a combination of flour substitutes like alum or chalk. Um, so the 1860 um, Adulteration of Food Act was the first law to prevent contamination of food, provided for the appointment of a food ana analyst. It was another blow to the concept of laissez-faire. However, only seven analysts were appointed, so many food inspections never took place. There were no compulsory inspections of food. The act was very much ignored, but it was revised in 1872 and eventually replaced by the 1875 Sale of Food and Drugs Act, which did improve things a lot. Let's have a look at Joseph Bazalgette. Now, Joseph Bazalgette was an engineer and he wanted to create a sewage system in London. Um, London sewers flowed into the central part of the River Thames and that led to an event in 1858. And you can see in the bottom right hand side, the uh, Silent Highwayman cartoon. It led to an event called the Great Stink of 1858, where basically there was a great stink in the Thames and Parliament had to sort of leave um, for the summer because it was so bad. Um, people believed in the miasma theory. So that was kind of like the spark for Basil Jett's new London sewage system to be created. 1,300 miles of sewers were created in London. Low level sewers were built behind embankments to take waste to a treatment plant and the spread of waterborne disease was prevented. And it's really successful that when there was the cholera outbreak in 1865 and 1866, London was much less badly affected than other cities um, within, um, within Britain. This is the Crossness pumping station, which opened in 1865, and just sort of the beauty of this building just kind of shows you how seriously the Victorians took their um, their sort of big infrastructure buildings during this time. So it's just worth having a look at that Crossness pumping station. Okay, the Sanitary Act of 1866. So the last cholera outbreak was 1865-66, and the cholera outbreak and the need to make local authorities responsible for public health led to this development. In terms of progress, it forced local authorities to take action to provide fresh water, sewage and waste disposal, um, sewage systems. All houses had to be connected to a main sewer. It defined what overcrowding was to tackle that. If local authorities did not carry out the work, they were billed by central government who did it for them. And it was another blow to laissez-faire. Limitations, the act was badly worded and it was quite slow to put into operation. So we've already mentioned the Sale of Food and Drug Act of 1875. There were basic food quality problems of adulteration, which needed solving. Harsh punishments are needed for those who continue to break the law. So the progress improved the quality of food, introduced harsh sanctions for food adulteration, and local authorities were given the power to seize unhealthy food. Now that combined with the invention of the tin can, which more people are getting food in tin cans and keep food um, preserved in those. Um, so some huge improvements in terms of the food that people are eating. Not many limitations to this one. OK, now the Public Health Act of 1875 is a really significant and turning point event. We'll look at that in a bit more detail in a moment. But this replaced the 1848 Act and the 1867 Reform Act have meant that working class men were now voters. And so their views had to be listened to. The Conservative Party under its leader, Benjamin Disraeli, particularly um, took up the mantle of promising what he made a speech talking about pure air and um, that he was going to provide for people, for voters. Local councils were forced to clean up towns and provide clean water and proper drains and Remember, the 1848 Public Health Act had not been compulsory. A medical officer had to be appointed by local councils. Sanitary inspectors had to be appointed. And it led to huge improvements in public health. So why was the 1875 Public Health Act a turning point? Well, big cities like Birmingham were quick to make huge changes to public health. Places like London had already benefited from Joseph Bazalgette's new sewer system. Um, so the 1875 Public Health Act was the first in a series of new laws to improve public health. 
So, for example, the 1875 Artisans Dwelling Act allowed councils to clear slums and build better homes for working families. The 1876 Sale of Food and Drugs Act banned use of harmful substances and food like chalk and flour. Laws against pollution of rivers were introduced and Epping Forest in London became a protected open space for people to enjoy. However, there was still a lot of poverty by 1900, which we'll look at in the next video. In 1900, life expectancy was still below 50 and 165 infants out of every 1,000 still died before their first birthday. Some local authorities were really slow to bring about the change. Dr. Bruce Law reported on the horrible condition of the River Rhonda in Wales in 1893. OK, so towards the end of the 19th century, there's a huge what we call slum clearance. So a slum is what we a word we use to describe some really um, horrible kind of area of really poor housing. Um, so um, the newly established London County Council ordered the clearance of the overcrowded old nickel slum and other slums across London. And new modern three bedroom tenements were built. Now, these weren't all perfect. But on the left hand side picture, you can kind of see the contrast between the old and some of the new types of housing. And then you can see one of the pictures of the old nickel slum on the bottom right hand side. You can see just how cramped it is and how badly built the homes look. OK, so we already seen from the Crossness pumping station how affected the Victorians were at building big infrastructure pro projects. Um, a good um, case study to have is the opening of the Thirlmere Dam in Manchester in 1894. Cities like Manchester that had, had expanded massively during the Industrial Revolution found providing fresh water difficult. So development in engineering helped projects like this to happen to provide clean water to big industrial cities. And basically fresh water was carried from a new reservoir um, from the Thirlmere Dam in the Lake District all the way down to Manchester. Um, it was a hugely successful engineering feat and it encouraged other towns and cities to have similar schemes. And you can see there that ceremonial fountain in the Albert Square in the heart of Manchester and people gathered there to celebrate the opening. Um, it took a long time to build, it took 15 years to be built from approval to completion. That's one of the limitations of it. OK, so another important um, aspect to look at in terms of local initiatives is the Women's Cooperative Guild. So the Women's Cooperative Guild held its first meeting at Hebden Bridge in Yorkshire in 1883, campaigned to improve both the political and legal status of women. It fought for improved maternity services, free school meals, better housing and clean water. And women were a very powerful force in the campaign for public health during this time. You can see there Margaret Llewellyn Davis, who's the General Secretary of the Women's Cooperative Guild from 1889 until 1921. So in terms of progress, it showed that women were a powerful force in campaigning for change. Other examples of ordinary working people campaigning for change as well and raised awareness of important improvements required. The government, though, did not fully embrace the ideas such as better maternity services or free school meals until after 1900. And then the last thing is about civil pride and new housing. So local authority housing in the 19th century provided people with better housing. The Manchester Corporation began to demolish slums in 1885. So we've already seen some of the slum clearance um, in London, for example, and in the Spitalfields area. Victoria Square was built in Ancoats, one of Manchester's worst slum districts in 1894. It had laundries, turrets and refuse chutes on each floor. Each pair of accommodation had its own sink and a privy, but that was only a start. So it showed that a new type of housing could be better. And it was great that some of the old slums from the Industrial Revolution were beginning to be demolished. Um, as we'll see in the 20th century, there's still quite a long way to go on housing. And in terms of limitations, the government um, don't fully improve housing. And there's lots of changes that still need to be made to housing after 1900. OK, so that was the People's Health Revision video on Industrial Britain, 1750 to 900. I hope you've enjoyed that and learned something from that. It's a great topic, learning about people's health and industrial revolution. Loads of interesting things we've learned about there in terms of things like cholera, some of the great engineering projects, the abandonment of laissez-faire. Um, and it's a really, really significant time period in terms of people's health. So thanks very much for listening and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.